In this lecture, we are going to be starting our next module where we're looking at the idea of the person. And what we're going to start with this week is we're going to start with the idea of with the person looking at the body itself, identity, and gender. So let's start with the discussion of what is identity? Well, identity usually has the qualities, beliefs, personalities, looks, and or expressions that make a person or group. One can regard the categorizing of identity as a positive or as destructive. How we identify can be negative in our lives. A, psycho a psychological identity relates to self-image, self-esteem, and individuality. An identity encompasses our memories, experiences, relationships, and values that creates one sense of self. And then things that we have no control over can also influence our identity, such as our height or our race. And now I want you to take a minute and think about how many different identities you actually have. Think about how you are at home, at work, when you're out with your friends, when you're with your family. And each of these roles holds meaning and expectations. And then we have this idea of being authentic. What does it mean to be authentic? Usually this means that, means that we are saying we're being who we truly are and not what we feel we are expected or what we are supposed to be. And so that's why for this week, I also have you watching a TED Talk that's dealing with this. Um, with her, what you're going to see in this is there, she's finding not only her identity, but finding the ability, and in this case, the courage, to be able to uh, be her true, authentic self. And so for the TED Talk, you're going to watch, it's called Breaking Binaries, Establishing Identity. So the reading I have you doing this week comes from a textbook called A World of Art by Henry M. Sayer. And so what we're going to look at here, it's interesting because it starts out with a discussion of the selfie. The selfie in the recent years has become one of the most popular forms of photography in the modern world. Jerry Slatt states, selfies, uh, selfies are a new visual genre a type of self-portraiture formally distinct from all others in history. So for a selfie, by definition, it must be taken by the self of the self. Usually these are taken at arm's length. Why? Because we often take them with our phone. It doesn't show both hands because one holding the camera is unseen, unless it's taken in a mirror or some other reflective surface, and then we also see the camera and the hands are visible. And what also makes selfies distinct is that selfies are a profoundly public form. They are meant to be shared. And so think about this. When you are creating selfies, right, you're creating this image of yourself to share with others. And in this moment, you're actually creating a type of identity. And you're creating a type of identity that you want others to see and therefore identify you as. Stoltz says, selfies are an, an instant visual communication of where we are, what we are doing, who we think we are, and who we think is watching, right? So people are showing what they're doing, and it creates also this sense of presence in the world, and it creates this sense of identity. So it's a way of showing ourselves, right? We have complete control over it, because if we don't like the selfie and we don't want to post it, we delete it. And so basically, it's a way for us to show the different us's that we have. We can show it to the world. I mean, and think about this. Think about when you create and post these images. The, if you're on a platform that says, you know, that maybe your mom's on, you're probably going to post distinctly different selfies than platforms that maybe you just share with your friends. And so what they do in this is they actually help capture this complex sense of our contemporary selves, that we literally, in a way, are able to create an identity and then put this identity out into the world. And that's actually what you are all going to be doing this week with your discussion board. For your discussion board, you are going to be taking and posting a selfie. And then you're also going to talk about why you chose this, to frame it this way. This needs to be a new image, not one that you've had before that you like. It needs to be created for this class. And I want you to think about, right, who you're sharing this with. You're sharing it with me, and you're also sharing it with your classmates, many of whom you've probably never even met. 
So think about this, and then there's a little more instructions in the discussion board post itself, but I want you to really think about how and why and what identity you are creating. All right, so now let's spend a little time talking about the body itself. And in this, we're going to categorize it as the body beautiful, because um, what is valued as beautiful also has a profound effect on our identities. And so if we talk about, you know, what defines beauty in different time periods and different cultures, beauty is drastically different. Even in today's day and age, you go to different cultures and these ideas of beautiful um, are very different. Well, what we can look at is when we look at the art of the past, usually remember artworks that are created show what is being valued. So when we look at the piece here, this is called Woman or Venus of Villendorf. That's where it was found. And this is a very old piece. It's circa 25,000 BCE. And what this was, this is a small piece of limestone. It's only about four and a half inches tall. And it was this small because it would be carried around. Because you have to remember at this time period, people are still living a nomadic life. They are traveling. This is one of the earliest depictions of the human body, and it's very typical of these depictions of the human body. And you have to remember, right, artwork is created to show what is valued. So when we look at this woman, we see her pendulous breasts, her wide hips, her swollen belly, and clearly shown genitalia. And this suggests what is most valued about the body. So here, she obviously has the ability to sustain herself for a period without food. And then not only that, but she would also have the ability to nour nourish a child. And that's what is valued in this time. Also, with the clearly shown genitalia, this would be um, referring to the idea of mating and creating children. And then the author claims that this was used as possibly a type of nonverbal communication. And in fact, it was invitations to interact and ultimately to mate. But it shows an encoded system of shared values about the body, sexuality, and survival. Now this next work, Uzugana Chama, this is a display figure, and it's from the Igbo people in Nigeria. And they were um, settled around the lower regions of the Niger River. Um, literally, the name means the eagle seeks out beauty. And again, this is a depiction of the female form, and it embodies all the attributes of beauty that the Igbo people profess. So you can see the exaggerated length of the neck. The white painted skin showed a preference for lighter skin. The intricate designs with the indigo that covers her body. And then the colloidal scars, which are the scars that are cut into the skin, I'm sorry, cuts into the skin and they create the raised scar. And then we also see her distended navel. Again, this is referencing back to um, fertility. And then in her right hand, you see she's holding something. It actually used to be an umbrella. And to these people, an umbrella signified wealth and prestige. So this figure, again, is showing us all the things that are valued. All right, and then next, we're going to move to the Western world. In the Western world, around the Renaissance, we become, um, we start to value what they consider the right proportions. And these having these right proportions became an absolute standard of beauty. And what this was, was the idea that the human form, the human body, is beautiful in direct relations to its perfect proportions. And you see that here in Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man from circa 1492. And this is where he pays homage to the Roman author Vitruvius, who followed along the lines with ideas of mathematical reasoning. And the idea is thus, the ideal figure reflects a higher mathematical order and embodies the ideal harmony between the natural world and the intellectual or spiritual realm. So such balance, harmony, and symmetry are the very definition of classical beauty. All right, now we're going to shift our focus a little bit and we're going to look at the body as being used for art, for being used for performative art. So performative art is, or performance art, I'm sorry, literally is art that is performed. That, unfortunately for us, everything we're going to watch has been a recording of it, 
or such as the work you're seeing here. These are different stills from a film. Um, but what a performative art is, is it's meant to have an audience. It's, a, it's a meant to be temporary, meaning you are going to experience over time, and then it is gone. So what we're starting with here is this is Carol Lee Sheenman, 1963, and the work is called I Body, 36 Transformative Actions. And what she was doing is she literally uses her body as the work of art. She says, I establish my body as visual territory. Not only am I an image maker, but I explore the image value of flesh as material I choose to work with. And so what she's doing here is her action is designed to begin to address the rift, both sexual and psychological, between men and women in the art world and beyond. And she's addressing this idea of the male gaze, that traditionally in art, women have been looked at as objects and often sexualized objects. And we'll discuss this more next week. Um, unfortunately, I was trying to find some sort of recording of this performance and I could not. Uh, the next is Joseph Bayou's 1974, and this is called I Like America and America Likes Me. And this performance, what he did was he wraps himself in this cocoon, where you see him here in this cocoon, and he travels to a gallery in New York City. What he does is he first flies in an airplane, and then he arrives in an ambulance. And what happens is in the gallery, there was this space, and there was a fenced-in space where he shared with a wild coyote for three days. And this was supposed to be a type of rebirth, a reemerging, a reemerging from him from coming out of the cocoon. Um, and he was influenced by the ideas of the, of shaman. And so for him, that's what the coyote represents, kind of more of the natural world. And so the principal theme was after he did this after a near death experience, and this is his rebirth through healing. An interesting story with this is that in the gallery, there was actually a cot for him to sleep on and then a bed of straw or hay for the coyote to sleep on. Well, the coyote actually slept on the cot and he had to sleep on the hay. Um, unfortunately, the YouTube clip that is in the lecture slides does not work anymore and I could not find a new one to replace it. All right, and then moving on, this one definitely has a reflection of um, our discussion of identity. So what I want you to do right now is pause this recording and then open up the lecture slides. That's where you'll go to the YouTube. Go to this slide on the lecture slides and click on this and watch what happens. This is by Kim Suja, and it's called Beggar Woman, Mexico City 2000. And what she's doing is she's using her, her body to investigate the human condition and all its frailty. And she was inspired by seeing a beggar woman. And so what happens to her, and I want you to pay attention to this, watch what happens to her when as she's sitting there being the beggar, when somebody actually comes up and puts money in her hand. And what happens is that basically she realizes she became the beggar woman. That up until that point, she knew she was the artist trying to make the point. But when he came up and put the money in her hand, literally her identity became the beggar woman. I also want you to pay attention to when the image is later in uh, her video of when she's being the homeless woman and how and when people interact with her or if they do at all. All right, next we are going to look at gender and identity. Now when we talk about gender, gender does not refer to one's biological sex. One's biological sex is determined by biology. So for female, you have two X chromosomes. For a male, you have an X and a Y chromosome. That is your biological sex. Gender traditionally refers to how we identify. Traditional gender roles uh, probably have more to do with social expectations than biological imperative. Um, think about this. So when we have a gender reveal party and it's blue, you know, balloons, it's a boy. If it's pink balloons, it's a girl. Why? Why is pink girls and blue boys? Because that's what society has put on us. And in the world, especially the Western world, we have traditionally looked at it as a binary, that it's either male or female, that there is nothing in between. 
Now we're going to see, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, that is being challenged and the idea that gender is more fluid, that there's not just these two binaries, male or female, that are acceptable. And what happens, you know, think about it. Think about how strongly society puts those expectations on us. Um, identity is something that's construction, constructed, not given. So when you hear phrases like be a man, well, what does that mean? That's usually said to a male who is not acting, you know, manly enough that they may be acting like a girl, like quit being a girl about it. That's being an insult. Why? Because women are supposedly weaker and more emotional. Um, the idea of throwing like a girl. Again, that's an insult to the man. Like you're not being manly enough. You're you're being female. Um, an idea just to show how much society places on it or influences it. Go walk down. Go to Target and walk down the toy aisles. Walk down the aisle that is supposed to be for girl toys, and think of, and look at what colors you see. Lots of pinks and purples and aqua blues and glitters and sparkles. Then you walk down the row of toys that are meant for boys. In that aisle, you're going to see lots of reds and browns and gold, um, lots of trucks and, and cars and soldiers. And so with these, these toys, give us the expectation, well, if you're a girl, you should like this stuff. If you're a boy, you should like this stuff. And it also plants the idea that if you don't like these things, if you don't conform to it, then there is something wrong with you. And that's how society helps create these gender expectations and these gender roles. So what we're going to look at in this section is we're going to look at how art can help construct identity and how it can actually help challenge it. So the first image you see here, this is by Cindy Sherman um, from the late 1970s. Um, this one's actually from 1981, and it is uh, a group of untitled film stills. Now, Cindy Sherman is a photographer, and almost all of her images are self-images. So she makes herself into these different characters. And this was actually something she was commissioned by Art Form magazine, which still exists today, to create a series of color photographs. And what she did is she created them to mirror the centerfolds that were in magazines such as Playboy. And you have to think about this, right? The woman's body that are in these magazines, such as Playboy, they are being looked at as a sexualized object, not as a person. And so what she was doing here is she's trying to show how much media uh, can affect or create identity. And so for in this one, when we look at it, right, we look and say, oh, what's going on? And I think most of us would say, well, she's sad because she's been sitting there, you know, waiting for the phone to ring, probably from a boy, and he's not called. And so she's trying to show that typical image. And what she does is with this depth of character and emotion, and she's simply revealing how pervasive and readable such stereotypes are, that probably all of us all had that same type of narrative in it. Um, many of these stereotypes regarding females are a product of the male gaze, and we will discuss this in more detail next week. Male gaze is how women are often viewed by men within the male-dominated society. Um, next, we're going to look, this is Andy Warhol's Marilyn Monroe from 1967, and it is a silkscreen print. Now, what he's doing here is it's not really paying homage to Marilyn Monroe, but it's looking at Marilyn Monroe as a commodity, as something that was created and meant to be consumed by the populace. So you have to remember, Marilyn Monroe is a totally created identity. She was born Norma Jean Mortensen, but to become famous and beautiful, she had to become something acceptable and beautiful to the male gaze. In fact, she said, my popularity seems almost entirely a male phenomenon. And so for Marilyn, she became this commodity. She had to become something that, you know, was, like I've already said, was basically consumed by the, by the public. And because of this, um, she became this often humiliating stereotype. Like she's the original dumb blonde, and she became this depersonalized sexual being and sometimes even a joke. And what happens is that it suggests that without this identity, she began to think that her life was not authentic. 
in her life had become meaningless. And there are many who suspect that because of this, because of this loss of identity, is one of the reasons why she committed suicide in 1962. Now, also interesting with creating the female image is usually it, women are seen in two ways, either the Madonna or the whore. And I'm not going to go into this in a lot right now because we're going to talk more about this next week. But do definitely read um, the sections in the textbook where he talks about Titian's Venus of Urbino and this idea of the honest uh, courtesan and even talking about the geishas in the Indo period in Japan. And then here we have Edward Manet's uh, Ligari saint Lerze. Pay attention to how he talks about this, about how the identities of the little girl and of the woman, and how they're kind of limited. Their identity is, limit, is based on their limited roles of what they are allowed to be in the 19th century France. And now it's not just the female identity that can be constructed, right? The male identity is also constructed. And so what we're looking at here with this photograph, this is by Richard Pierce. In the 1980s, he was hired to photograph the Marlboro Man. And I don't know if any of you remember what the Marlboro Man is, but it was an advertising campaign to sell cigarettes. And what this was, was it wasn't even just selling a product. It was selling a lifestyle, right, that... The smoker is, you know, the cowboy. It's this independent, rough-and-tumble hero. And the cowboy image was very, very popular in the United States. Um, in the 1940s to the 50s, almost all American males in some way aspired to be the cowboy, right? This, this man's man. And so what this says, this ad is saying... Well, if you smoke Marlboro cigarettes, then you are related to this, right? You are this cowboy. You are this man's man. Well, what's interesting is he does in this later series of photographs is he re-photographs the original ads and he's underscoring the, in, the inauthenticity of the ad campaign. And it's saying that the Marlboro man here is actually galloping towards his death. And that the American male was mistaking dependence for independence. Because when you get hooked on cigarettes, you are then dependent on them. And interestingly enough, the, the model who was the marble man actually died of lung cancer. Here's another image that's interesting. Now take a minute and read through this one. Now what's interesting is as you read this, right, it gets very violent. And what's interesting is that this is uh, Mel Bochner's win from 2009. And this was actually commissioned to be in the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. And as you read through it, you begin to understand the violence that underscores the game of football. Now, also, when we look at identity, we can look at identity. This is challenging. So we have the gay rights movement that officially is seen to start in the United States on June 28, 1969, with the Stonewall Riots. Um, this was where, in the Stonewall Inn in New York's Greenwich Village, where um, it was an inn, it was a bar commonly known where homosexuals would go, and they would often be raided by police um, pretty much for no reasons and be harassed. And what happens on June 28th is there is a police raid, but those who are inside, it was kind of the moment where they were like, no, we're not going to put up with this any longer. And it started three days of rioting. Um, because of this, it's seen as the official gay rights movement in the United States. And many of these had been, um, this is not to say there weren't people who fought for gay rights before this, but it was a smaller movement and it was almost more of a closeted, if you will, movement. Why? Because homosexuals had very, very little to no protection. Um, there were times where homosexuality was a crime. Homosexuality was actually listed as a mental illness at one time. And homosexuals had very little protection. In fact, up until 2020, the summer of 2020, you could still be fired from your job for being homosexual. What happens with this, though, with the Stonewall riots, is this is where this movement is starting to come more into the mainstream. In fact, the next year, we have the first ever gay pride parade in the United States. 
So what you're looking at here, this is an image by Andy Warhol again, and it's from his series called America in 1985, which is a collection of Polaroids. But what's interesting is it shows Lance Loud. Now Lance Loud was an individual, and we could say he's one of the first ever reality TV stars. And what happens is his family was kind of seen as this all-American family. So they were chosen to be in this documentary called An American Family. And the goal was to show the day-to-day -day lives of normal Americans. Well, what happened during the show is the parents actually got divorced. Lance, who was one of the children, was openly homosexual. And this spurred a natural controversy in which it showed this, this fantasy idea of the American uh, family as seen on TV was, was false. And then Lance himself started the band The Mumps in 1978. And what's interesting in this image here is we're not seeing him as Lance the TV star, Lance as the open homosexual. We're seeing him as Lance the rock star. Um, and what we're seeing during this time period is we're starting to see more of these sexual stereotypes being challenged as never before. And then there are more ways of challenging gender, ide gender identity. Uh, Cross-dressing is a strategy. Um, this is a strategy announcing that one's biological sex is not necessarily coincides with one's gender identity. And so in the recent years, cross-dressing has become, um, cross-dressing has been around for a very long time, but it's become, I don't want to say popular, but I guess maybe popular is the term, but almost a little more accepted because we're seeing it more and more in mainstream media and shows such as RuPaul's Drag Race have a large part to do with that, that they've been on, uh, the on TV for a long time, shows their success, and they show that people see them and relate with them. Well, what you're looking at here, this is an image of the very famous artist Marcel Duchamp. And here, Marcel Duchamp is dressed as his alter ego, uh, Eros C'est la Vie, which is a play on the terms Eros, and then C'est la Vie, which means that's life. And here he is dressed as his female identity. This was photographed by Man Ray. And Duchamp is actually wearing the hat and coat of a female friend. And if you look at the hands, those are actually not a man's hands. Those are actually also the friend's hands. But you see here, right, He's what they're challenging is saying, ask if what we see is reality or not. Uh, another example of an artist challenging this. This is Eleanor Anton's My Kingdom is the Right Size from 1974. And this was from a series called The King of Salona Beach. And what she did was that she became this male persona. And not merely a male, right? She was the king. She became a powerful male. And what she did was she, designed, she created this um, personage and it designed, uh, it allowed her to explore dimensions of her own self that might have otherwise remained hidden. And it allowed her to experience the world in a way she was never able to as a female. And she says the usual aids to self-definition, sex, age, talent, time, and space are merely tyrannical limitations upon my freedom of choice. So in the image here, she's the middle figure with the hat on. And so again, she is adapting a different identity to explore the world in a different way. And then our final image here, this is by Kiata, who is he, she is Japanese Somalian descent, and she is a transgender woman, meaning she was biologically male, who now lives as a woman. But what's interesting is among the Samoan peoples, this is socially acceptable and widely practiced. Why? Because they don't believe in the binary, just the male or female. They have accepted belief of, an, of a third gender, which is the fa'a feminine. And so what happens here in this work is he is recreating photographs that were popular in the 19th and the 20th century. And what it was is Westerns, uh, people in the Western world would buy them, you know, these photographs of these, you know, rustic, uh, basic individuals, um, primitive, if you will. And what it is, is that they thought, um, this reminded them this is dream of this primitive culture where unity, peace, and naked innocence was far removed from the turmoil of civilized life. 
Well, what's interesting, these photographs that were so popular in the 19th and 20th century were almost always all completely staged. People knew they would sell. And so they would take individuals who somewhat looked like the natives and they would dress them in traditional garb, put them with objects that people often associate with the culture. And then they would take these photographs of them. And the photographs would almost always be taken in some sort of photography studio. So again, completely staged. Well, that's what she's also doing here. She's setting this up to you know, show us these completely falsified settings. But what's interesting here is it's also talking about identity. So she posed herself as the woman in the photograph. She's wearing the traditional garb and holding status symbols. However, what's also interesting is she is also the male figure. So if you look at the face of the male figure, it is actually also her face with a wig and makeup on and it's superimposed on the photograph. So this photograph is challenging accepted notions of identity at every level. Gender, roles, colonial assumptions about uh, Samoan culture, and even the reality of the photographic image itself. So why at first this photo seems quite simple, if you will, it is literally challenging what we see and asking us if we can actually believe what we see.